Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. And I'm very pleased to be joined today by Jonathan Rausch, a longtime friend and someone I've admired a lot and uh, looking very much looking forward to hearing from, author of an excellent new book, The Constitu- I should hold this up here, that's what you're supposed to do, The Constitution of Knowledge, A Defense of Truth, published by uh, the Brookings Institution, where he's a s- s- senior fellow. In a way, this book, John, I think is a follow-up to a book you wrote, God, it's hard to believe, almost three decades ago, uh, Kindly Inquisitors, Attacks on Free Thought, which I, I remember well uh, reading at the time. So, John, thanks for, thanks for joining me today. It's a, a special pleasure. I love the podcast, and your father helped me with the Kindly Inquisitors at, at AEI all those years ago, so this in that way closes a circle. Oh, that's great. I didn't even I didn't know that, so that's good. that's good to hear. You also wrote an excellent piece last year. I thought I might just begin with that for a couple of minutes before getting into the uh, the things you particularly focus on in the book. Um, in National Affairs, I think it was about a year ago, two years ago, I guess, on polarization and partisanship. And it does seem to me that uh, that was more about the political moment or uh, and, and sort of, uh, but it seems to me to lay the groundwork for what you talk about in uh, uh, in the book. So say, say a few words about sort of how we got to be so polarized and, and partisan. Well, they relate to each other. The, um, the way we're used to thinking about polarization is as people divided ideologically over issues, you know, taxes up, taxes down, abortion, yes, abortion, no. What we've seen emerge in the last 10, 15 years is something different. It's what, um, people call affective polarization and negative partisanship. And that's where it's not so much about issues. It's about not liking the other side. It's actually hating and fearing them. And the interesting thing about that is it doesn't necessarily correlate with people liking their own party. Um, It's that they like the other party even less. It's called the lesser of two evils identity defense, which is when I don't really like my team, but I defend my membership in the team by really hating the other team. And that leads to this weird dynamic where the worse my team behaves, the worse I have to think about the other team. And that leads to these downward spirals we're seeing. And that's part of what led me to write this book, which is, okay, where is this coming from? And my realization, one of the things it's coming from is a deliberate campaign to divide, polarize uh, Americans. Yeah, no, I mean, I think a lot of the political scientists who debated how much partisanship there is, not just among elites or politicians, but among this, the, the, the country, the, the, the population as a whole, the public as a whole. And I think that debates, whatever was, the truth was 10 or 20 years ago, it does seem like it's permeated down to the public now, the kind of tribalism and so forth. Um, it does seem like that laid the groundwork for, I mean, for Donald Trump, obviously, but also for people on the left to do certain things. Uh, it, it does seem so resonant that the notion of this uh, affective polarization, which isn't so much about issues. God knows Trump was not, was less conservative. In fact, some people would welcome that almost in 2015, 2016, less ideological, I guess you'd say, than, than uh, the normal way we think about polarization or partisanship. But um, I guess there are a million political and cultural and social reasons for the polarization and the partisanship. But into that world of tribalism, to use another word that you use and others use to characterize this moment comes Donald Trump. So say a word about, I mean, I don't want to dwell on Trump too much in this talk. Uh, there's so much more to talk about, but we should begin with him because it's, he's important, right? Yeah, we, we should. And actually the point you made on the way to the question about Trump is, is very important, which is I, I did a deep dive in this new book on disinformation and how it works. These are very old and very powerful psychological techniques that exploit cognitive vulnerabilities. But what they're ultimately about to, uh, out to do is weaken the target population by dividing them. And it turns out there's, there's a kind of cycle that goes on here. So a divided population, one that is polarized, is much more receptive to disinformation because people are more willing to believe conspiracy theories about the other side and they're more willing to, to believe uh, disinformation that helps them defend their point of view. And then the disinformation itself is aimed at further polarizing the public. That's what Vladimir Putin was up to in 2016 when they used disinformation tactics, you know, to to spur simultaneous demonstrations on both sides of an issue across the street from each other, 
what they're trying to do is weaken society by polarizing it. So polarization and propaganda are two sides of the same coin. They feed each other. That's the spiral we're in now. So we were headed down that road well before 2016. But, but a game changer happens in 2016, and that's Donald Trump. What I'm about to say will sound partisan. Uh, I don't think it is. I understand why people will say it is. But I'm, a, I'm of the center right, very much like where you are, Bill. Uh, right. I have voted for and supported many Republicans, and I wish I could do so today. But Donald Trump is a game changer, not ideologically, but because he had made a career manipulating information in the media environment. He knew how to do it. We knew that because he told us in interviews. This was someone who in the 2016 campaign did something Americans were completely unprepared for. He used a technique called the fire hose of falsehood. This is a technique that the Russians are especially fond of, and that's where you just pour out so many lies, half-truths, and conspiracy theories that the media can't keep up, the public can't keep up by the time they've refuted one or tried to refute it. All they've done is amplify it, and meanwhile, you've issued 10 more. By the end of the 2016 campaign, PolitiFact, which is rating Clinton and Trump, clocks Hillary Clinton at 25% of what she says is either uh, mostly or entirely false. And that's bad. We don't, we don't praise that. But the equivalent figure for Donald Trump is 70%. What, what's coming out of his mouth is more likely to be false than true. So what he's doing is what his advisor, Steve Bannon, calls flooding the zone with shit. And this is a powerful disinformation tactic that's designed to disorient people, to confuse them, to give up on trusting anyone so they become cynical and they become open to, say, dictatorship or cult of personality. And Trump... I believe, is a kind of genius. Uh, I believe, you know, people dismiss him and they say, well, the guy's a buffoon, thank goodness, or democracy wouldn't have survived. He is not a buffoon in the realm of information warfare. He is the most talented innovator since the 1930s because he figured out how to adapt Russian-style disinformation to U.S. politics. And this is a naive population. We had never faced that before. No one, no politician of either party had ever dreamed of trying this. Uh, and then it got much worse last year. Stop the Steal is easily the most audacious and sweeping and effective disinformation campaign that anyone, domestic or foreign, has ever run against the United States. And the result is what we see now, heightened polarization, belief of 70 percent of the Republican Party that the election was stolen. And if we don't figure out what's going on and rally against it, it gets worse, not better. Yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, I myself always thought people underestimated the extent to which Trump was a con man and that you could learn a fair amount by reading about the history of different, you know, con men and their marks. And one of the reasons people stuck with Trump is that marks don't like to admit that they've been conned and so forth. But I, you're going beyond that, I think. I and mean, that's, I think, very important what you're saying, that it's not just, you know, you've got a fake story, you're, you know, financial con man and you make up the returns that your investors are going to get and then you manage to stay ahead of the truth one uh, by you know a, a few a league or a few steps ahead of the truth by uh, continuing to make up new stories but but that it's more systematic the kind of disorientation that Trump is purposely engaging in yeah and uh, and he's using a whole suite of these tactics and they're again they're well known they're well studied one of them is what we call trolling but this was perfected by Hitler and Goebbels, who said, we don't care if they laugh at us. We don't care if they say bad things about us. The point is, we want them to think about us all the time. So when Trump issues daily multiple outrages, offending norms, trolling people, you know, accusing a former congressman of, of murdering an aide, you know, ludicrous stuff like this, we might think, what is he doing? Is he a crazy person? But he understands that with outrage, you can hijack attention because another cognitive vulnerability of people is we rush to the defense of our tribe or our sacred values. We can't really help it. We can't let these things stand. So he's able to hijack attention. That's what trolling is doing, and he does that systematically. There's another tactic, conspiracy bootstrapping. That's where you say you, you see the conspiracy or you pick one up, and then you say, well, a lot of people are saying this, and then you demand an investigation, or you say that the media is covering it up, and then you do this 10 times in a row, and uh, and then you spread these conspiracies. He's very good at that. You know, he's constantly saying, well, you know, 
I'm not sure, but some people are saying that Joe Scarborough murdered his wife. People should look into that. Um, and so he's merchandising this stuff. So, so these are all age-old techniques, and they're very effective, and he's very good at them. And now they've been adopted by the Republican Party, not just Trump. The recount, the, the so-called audit in Maricopa County in Arizona is, is an example of that. No, I think that's that's good. I mean, well, I think he yeah, was Scarborough's aide, not his wife. Not his wife. His aide. Um, yeah, his wife. But the um, yeah, the outrages are not there for like a, a Trumpian excess that he'd be better off without. I think that's one of your key insights and points. I mean, when you really thought through this, the kind of demagoguery Trump is engaged in. Harvey Maxwell said this right after the election in a conversation we had that the uh, the outrages demagogues like being outrageous. It sort of fits into their success of the demagogy. It's not they're not outrageous they're not successful despite saying things that are over the line, right? They're successful because they somehow they say things that are that are over the line and acclimate people to not quite to believing them. I mean explain that a little more. What do they acclimate people to? Just just not believing anything? I, I don't it's a little hard to get your hand, your head around it if you're kind of used to operating in normal <laughs> democratic politics. Well, you know, it's yeah, a serious yeah, right. As you said, we're naive. I feel that myself. You know, you're used to operating in normal democratic, sometimes demagogic, sometimes hyper-ideological. I'm embarrassed about some things I've said in the past. But but still, this, it's different in kind somehow and quality that, from, from what Trump is engaged in. Yeah, this requires transposing our brains to a space where Americans are just not used to thinking about. So the way I think about what these tactics have in common, because different ones exploit different vulnerabilities, and that's before we get to cancel culture, which is also a form of information warfare. But information warfare, or as I call it, epistemic warfare, is the art of organizing and manipulating the social and media environment in order to dominate, divide, disorient, and ultimately demoralize the target population. So you can dominate the debate, that's what trolling is doing, you can divide the other side, heighten polarization, that's what Trump did every day, you know, with, for example, Liberate Michigan, turning right. masks into a divisive issue, and doing that on purpose, he knows what he's doing. Disorienting, that's the fire hose of falsehood, that's flood the zone with shit, that's make people cynical and confused because they hear so much that's coming from so many sources that's so outrageous that they no longer what to believe, don't know what to believe. A, a good example of that was Senator John Neely Kennedy saying during the, the Ukraine scandal, well, we don't know whether Russia hacked Democratic servers or whether Ukraine do it. We never will know. Well, that's not true. We do know. It was Russia. It was not Ukraine. But the condition, the mental condition that this campaign is seeking to induce is one of confusion, disorientation, we'll never know, I don't know who to trust, I'm cynical, so Donald Trump, tell me the truth. And the ultimate goal of all of these things is to demoralize the target population, make them feel like they don't know who to trust, they can't control the debate. Demoralization is demobilization, and that makes them politically passive and much easier uh, to demagogue, and that's that's what we've seen in, in the U.S. But the target population, just to be clear, what's I think so interesting about your formulation, the target population is your own potential supporters, not the opponents. I mean, usually think of yeah. targets as the other side, but you're yeah. saying that he's he's both demoralizing them, but then he's kind of motivating them, right? An awful lot of them voted for him. He's He's got energized supporters. Yeah. So how does that fit together? Yeah, you want to do both, and you can do both. You know, Putin is very happy if he can convince Americans that, um, you know, the 2016 election was stolen or whatever. But he's also happy with a subsidiary goal, which is just to confuse people so that they think they don't know who's telling the truth. He's happy with either one, and, and he can do both. And the answer is, it turns out, you do do both. So studies that look at this find that you can convince, you know, a solid minority of people, like, say, a lot of Republicans of a conspiracy theory, and they'll believe that the falsehood is true. But then there's another group, which is two to three times larger, which can get you to over a majority of the American public that say, well, I just don't know who's telling the right. truth anymore. And so you want to do both. And Trump has done both. He's convinced a substantial share of the public. Most Republicans, the election was stolen. And he's convinced many other people, well, we don't really know for sure. We have all these doubts about the outcome of the election. It's a win either way. And it's also a win if you just get people talking about it, right? If you get people repeating the claim, even to refute it. 
No, that's good. I mean, I, I've quoted Havel many times, all of us have, and, you know, different versions of what he said about the demoralization, in a sense, the confusion, the uncertainty about truth plays into a dictator's hands, an autocrat's hands in, let's say, Eastern Europe and the Central Eastern Europe in the 70s and 80s. But this is a little more complicated because he's both, you know, I mean, they just wanted a passive population. They didn't really care if there weren't that many enthusiastic supporters of whatever, you know, second or third rate hack, you know, communist dictator was now in power atop that bureaucratic party infrastructure. But Trump wants, and the trick with Trump and what's sort of impressive in a terrible way is the, the combination of huge enthusiasm, almost cult-like devotion from his, some chunk of followers, and then the confusion of the others, and they just go along with it because it, they dislike the other side more. So it does get back, incidentally, to the negative partisanship yeah. side of it. It's very, very important, right, that you need that as the ground for for the acquiescence to the the demagogue on your side, I guess. Yeah, these things are building each other. If you're a propagandist, the condition you want to induce is that propaganda is a participatory sport. It's not a spectator sport. So what you're going to do is scour the environment for a conspiracy theory or a lie or whatever, or even a half-truth. It's, it's sort of taking off out there. Maybe it's anti-vaxxers. And then you can latch onto it, and you can amplify it, and then you can get the people out there to continue building it so you and the population, your support population, kind of collaborate in this process of going down these epistemic rabbit holes. You amplify each other. We saw this all the time with Trump and his rallies. That's kind of what he's doing. He's trying these themes. He's seeing what resonates. He's picking up on what comes back. He's amplifying that. And the ultimate goal, what you're doing with all of this stuff, is dividing and polarizing the target population, which makes them even more vulnerable. And that's why these tactics are so dangerous when applied to a naive population like America, where it just, it never occurred to us, Bill, that we would see a president of the United States and a major political party applying Russian-style, Eastern European-style disinformation to our own population. A, a domestic attack seems so unthinkable that, that even now, you know, the standard story is more like, well, there are lots of social forces, and they're causing polarization. There's the decline of organized religion, and there's the stagnation of middle-class, white, working-class incomes, and and there's social media and whatnot. And, and yeah, I'm happy to have those conversations. There's truth in all of that. But let's not neglect what's there in front of our nose, which is the United States has been targeted by a massive, systematic, and very sophisticated information warfare attack for a period of years now. Yeah, and it's, uh, we're not doing terribly well. At, res or at least half of us aren't doing very well at resisting <laughs> it. And we'll get to the other half because there's problems on the on the left, as you as you detail in the book, and as you as you talk. Actually, in a way, the first book at 30 years ago, well, almost 30 years ago, was even more about that that side of things I think but you know one thing you said very early on just in passing about uh, I think it's in the context of effective polarization uh, was that people become unhappy even with their own side but then they somehow the spiral intensifies I, I've always had the hunch but I never thought about it until now that Trump's attacks on Republican his Republican predecessors uh, as nominees and as presidents McCain and Romney and the Bushes and so forth the conventional view and I think I probably shared it was well that it's got to hurt him in a Republican primary. It's a little crazy. To be, I mean, whatever people think of their presidencies or their, their those people as political leaders, they're, by definition, lots of Republicans voted for them at least once, right? So it's kind of odd to sort of go out of your way to attack them. But don't you think, but I think what you're saying is that in a way that was also part of the, that was a not a, a bug, but a feature, right? The, the kind of discrediting almost the prior leaders on your own side and, and, taking advantage of people's disappointment that they didn't win or disappointment that some of the policies didn't work out and so forth. The attack on McCain as a, so he prefers, you know, people who weren't captured. Maybe <laughs> that, well, it didn't hurt yeah. him. I remember yeah, that. We thought time. it was over that day. I still yes, remember. Yes, I said okay. it was over. Two That's days the later end on. of Donald Trump. Right. But it, and so say a word about that. Though. I'm struck by that. I, I guess people in this kind of environment get unhappy even with their own side of the, of the partisan and polarized environment, right? And he somehow is, was able to exploit that as well. He's able to, he's a very sophisticated guy. We know this because he's been using these tactics to basically throughout his professional career. He's very good at them and he understands a couple things. 
First is if you want to build a cult of personality and you want to be a demagogue, you want to demolish the institutions and establishments that stand in your way, the professionals and the people like John McCain. Uh, you don't want that. They're going to try to block you if they can. They don't want the Republican Party to become a fiefdom of a, of a single person. Or at least limit you when you're in office and so forth. I mean, I do think the collapse of the Republican establishment after he became president, which is so striking, and we should talk about it for a minute, he, lay, he understood in a way almost ahead of time that he didn't want that to be, he wanted to start undermining that as well. Don't you yeah, think? And, and the demolitions of, of all institutions of trust is, again, it's what disinformation is out to do. And then he also intuitively, I think, understood the second thing, which is what you just said, um, that he's not out there to stimulate more affection for the Republican Party. Because the Republican Party isn't him. It's that if he can twist these loyalties in such a way as to behave badly, but then convince people that the Democrats are even worse, you know, American carnage and, uh, and, and corrupt Hillary and all the rest of it, he can create one of these disinformation spirals. Um, and so he's doing both of those things in 2016, and people like you and me are thinking, this man must be out of his mind. That's, you can't function that way in American politics. He's, he's going to lose. He's going to self-marginalize. Uh, well, well, he was way ahead of us. Yeah, he wants to demonize the Democratic Party and the liberals and the left, of course, but he wants to weaken the Republican Party too. And what in the past, yeah, one would have understanding that, that his followers will then demonize the Repu the Democrats all the more, and it will weaken Republicans' uh, chances of limiting him in certain ways, either as a candidate or as president. Yeah, I mean, it is as you say. It's quite. And this is familiar stuff. You see this in the '30s. This is what the. You know, I'm, I'm not making a substantive comparison between Republicans and Nazis, please. I'm definitely not doing that. Mm. But just in terms of the mechanics of information warfare, this is what Hitler was doing. Um, this is what Putin does. This is, these are standard techniques. There's nothing here that's really surprising to people who know that world. What about the conspiracy side of it? That, I think, has been very striking. I mean, we've always had conspiracies, and Richard Hofstadter wrote about it, and the paranoid style and so forth, and the you know, Birchers, and uh, conspiracy so vast, Joe McCarthy. But somehow, again, Trump's use of that seems, I don't know, that was a con they had conspiracy theories, and then they got sort of falsified, or at least people decided, come on, that's not quite how it's working, even if I don't like some of what these uh, people on the other side are doing. And the conspiracies kind of faded away, you might almost say, if you think of, I think, or were, were rebutted eventually. Trump's use of conspiracies uh, seems a little different somehow. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's much different because he's weaponized them. He figured out uh, that conspiracy theories go viral, that they disorient the other side, that they confuse supporters, and that they're participatory and fun, you know, QAnon supporters. Um, they're having the time of their life, a lot of them, because they're finding these communities online and they're developing these narratives of which they are the heroes. And it's very participatory. Someone will say, well, what about this? What about that? And other people will pick it up so you feel included. And he can harness that dynamic to set loose all these epistemic fires, which the rest of us don't know how to put out. Because if you refute a conspiracy theory, you actually amplify it. It turns out the more often you repeat something, even if it's false, the more it kind of installs itself in people's brains. But if you don't refute them, then they run wild. Um, this is a very difficult situation. The real answer to this, the only real defense against conspiracism as a political weapon, is not to use it in the first place. And that's what we did for a long time. Most politicians, most of the time, of both parties could be relied on to squelch a conspiracy theory. You know, um, wasn't it uh, John McCain famously in 2008 when someone said, was it Obama wasn't born here, or Obama's not a good American, or something of that sort, told the person to their face, I disagree with you, that is not right. And that was considered yeah. part of a politician's job, was just disamplifying this stuff. Some people are going to believe it, but it makes a world of difference, a continent, an order of magnitude of difference if you have the President of the United States and his party weaponizing and amplifying this in conjunction with, we haven't talked about conservative media yet, you know more about that than I do, but a lot of conservative media is in the business of, instead of disconfirming stuff that's false, transmitting it uh, because it's very popular with the viewership, and if they don't, they lose viewership to someone else, you know, Fox loses viewership to OAN if it calls the Arizona election. So. Yeah. You also get conservative media, 
which is not a barrier to conspiracy theories and is in fact amplifying them. You know, Sean Hannity for a month is on Fox News talking about the Hillary Clinton and the Democrats and the murder of Seth Rich. That's not what news is supposed to be doing, right? It's supposed to be disamplifying stuff that's false, not amplifying it. So you get this dance between Trump and the Republicans, conservative media who are seeking ratings, and this sector of the public which wants to feel empowered by these narratives in which they're the hero and it's an apocalyptic moment and only Trump can save us and we're the insiders with the knowledge. When you add those things up, you get these spirals that we're now in. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I think the normal account, let's just say on the right, um, you know, Bill Buckley policed the, the boundaries, expelled or disavowed the John Birch Society, but and it's often presented as sort of preventing real extremists from taking over or from flourishing. But the more I think about it, I think the conspiracy thing is, is key because, you know, the truth is you could have, quote, extreme ideologues, people who believe that, I don't know, the federal government should spend 4% of GDP and they should be privatized, everything should be private, you know, let's just say an ortho, a very uh, orthodox or uh, dogmatic libertarian or, or the same on social conservatism. Even. Those, but they, actually, no one ever really thought that's a big problem. I mean, it's fine if someone wants to make that kind of argument and has read his von Mises and you know Murray Rothbard and thinks that whatever. It's the conspiracism that really is dangerous, right? It, it's not the in a way more than the extremism. Of course, they go together, and but and I think that's uh, and Trump's embrace of conspiracism is really distinctive yeah. for, and, and now for a I'd major add, party candidate, but but for a president of the United well, States. Well, now I now I'd add the party because Trump is off Twitter, he's off Facebook, um, he's not the figure he once was, but now we see the Republican Party embracing these tactics, yeah. and we see that, as I mentioned, in the Arizona, the so-called audit, which is now, that, that's basically propaganda theater to, um, to cast right. doubt on the election results and implant conspiracy theories and inspire copycats around the country, which is what it's now doing, and that's being led by Republicans in state and local governments. Trump is aiding and abetting it. Uh, but now we see this is now a Republican pattern. And, and yeah, you're, you're exactly right. What you said just now, Bill, is, is so important, especially for conservatives to understand, but liberals and, and everyone, which is the methods that we're talking about, information warfare, epistemic warfare, propaganda, disinformation, conspiracism, whatever you call it, it's not ideological. It's a toolkit that is exploiting social and cognitive vulnerabilities for political gains. And anyone can use it, and it's dangerous no matter how you use it. But it's not about whether taxes are too high or low, or Obamacare, or socialism, or guns, or any of those things. It's separate. It's a separate layer. In this respect, it's very, very different from, let's say, Goldwater, or, you know, there was a kind of extremism at times, and, uh, you know, recklessness, you might say, in things he said, and the same with his heirs. But again, there wasn't that much of the, the kind of the conspiracy stuff is really what uh, is striking. And I do think that fits in with another point you made in passing, which maybe you could elaborate on a bit, which is, I would if I remember saying four or five years ago, you know, Trump's exploiting anxieties and unhappiness and bitterness among people because of the country's changing in ways they don't like or understand or they don't think they were consulted about or their economic standing isn't what it, they hoped or the kids aren't doing as well as they hoped, whatever. And people would say, but you know, you say it, make it sound like they were all bitter and unhappy, but when you go to a Trump rally, people are kind of enjoying it. They don't, and it, there's some truth to this when you look, you know, it's a weird combat, they, they, there's a lot of, there's some hatred there and, 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 and anger, no question, but there's also a lot of, this is a fun time at this rally and I'm, we all together are, you know, uh, sticking it to the establishment of our own party as well as to the other party and stuff. And I suppose that fits in too, right? I mean, the, the kind of, as you say, it's a participatory endeavor. It's not just, uh, and people enjoy it, I guess. Oh, yeah, it's way fun. You know, truth, finding truth, staying truthful, this is boring. It's expensive. It's very limiting. It's not even what really we're wired for as human beings. We're wired to... To, to register and seek out viewpoints that enhance our status uh, or our position in the group or our identity or that tell us stories that we want to hear about ourselves. And, and this is nothing new. You know, Plato said this, right? That's why we needed the philosopher king to steer us away from all these errors down here in our cave. And 
the purpose of, of the Madisonian political system, and what I call in my book the Constitution of Knowledge, which is the Madisonian epistemic system, very similar, is to steer us away from those impulses by forcing us to channel these impulses toward tribalism and toward absolutism and believing weird stuff into situations where we have to negotiate with other people to, who, who disagree with us, um, either to make law or to make knowledge. And that's the disciplinary process that, that basically keeps society in touch with reality and out of civil war. But it's not fun particularly. I mean, if, if you think about, you know, when you're the editor of the Weekly Standard, all the apparatus that's going into to editing and, and fact-checking and, and making sure things are on the level or in the, you know, the world of science and academia or law, all the many checks and balances that are at work there to make sure that people aren't just making stuff up and playing these, you know, these exciting conspiratorial games. Um, all of that is expensive and it's difficult and it's not fun and it requires a lot of maintenance and, and care and feeding and civic virtues and, and all of that stuff that, that you've written and thought so much about. And yeah, it's just way more fun to shortcut all that and go straight to whatever your religious view is or your apocalyptic political conspiracy or, or whatever it is. That's only human. The, the amazing thing is that we ever don't do that. Right. Well, we've done, most of us have probably done versions of that for most of history, which is why the liberal Madisonian regime was a quite great accomplishment. No, but I, I think you're right, both personally, this has been studied a lot, of course, from before Plato on, I mean, it's not as we would like to think that you know, the truth is both attractive and sets you free, and therefore one wants to always get closer to the truth. Maybe a few people do, but an awful lot of the time, of course, uh, one knows this in one's own life. But discovering the truth isn't pleasant. It's sort of, oh my God, I've been wrong about something for X number of months or years, and I have to now sort of correct things I've said or correct uh, attachments I've made and so forth. So it's not as if people, the more natural thing is to be happy in one's tribe, one's... Yeah, yeah, there's group. studies finding people would rather have root canal than be exposed to political views that they expect they won't like. And, you know, Socrates, he gets... he gets What happens to him, right? Right. <laughs> no, and the great liberal breakthrough is to, in a way, I mean, to stop trying to hope that you can persuade people to be more reasonable, not, not entirely to some of that, or, or more uh, open to the truth, I'm not wildly oversimplifying, but but to set up a structure of institutions and checks and uh, separation of powers and checks and balances and skepticism sort of embodied in institutions that uh, takes human nature as it is and then says, but we're going to manage to damp down a lot of the fanaticism and uh, tribalism and channel it and limit it and check it and so forth. And uh, and, and as you said, it's kind of complicated. I think one great virtue of your book is that it's not just a political arrangement. It's not just Federalist, you know, 10 and 50 watt and, you know, Congress and the, and the courts and so forth. It's a social arrangement, a cultural arrangement, a epistemic arrangement, if you want to, you know, which, which I think is very important. But maybe let's come to that in a minute. But I, let me just talk, let's not do it injustice and leave aside entirely cancel culture and, and that side of the kind of... Uh, hostility also to a, to this kind of liberal, if I can use that term in the broadest sense, uh, arrangement. So say, say if that was your original focus, wasn't it, back in 93? And, uh, and to yeah. say a word about that, has it gotten worse? Is it really as bad as people say? What What's happening on the left? Yeah, it's so gotten worse broadly. and it's as bad as people say. You know, Bill, when I, when I wrote the Constitution of Knowledge, um, I, I basically finished it before the election. I had some opportunity to revise it after November. But when I wrote this book, you know, there's actually more in it about canceling, which I'll, I'll, we'll get into in a second. It's also a form of information warfare. It's a different form, but it's got the same general goals. Uh, I had more about that because right. what I thought was likely to happen was Biden would probably win the election. I thought, you know, two to one odds. And then Trump would go away and the Republican Party would go back to something more like sanity and a whole chapter about, you know, Trump's disinformation um, would be obsolete. People would say, well, yep. why do I have to read about this? The problem is solved. I had no idea that the post-election would turn out the way it has and that the problem would ramp up. So in the book, a lot of the material is about the, a different kind of disinformation. And that's where you use social coercion in order to silence, intimidate, isolate people who you don't want the public to hear from. And also, you use these tactics in a more subtle way, which is you, you do what, what I call consensus spoofing. 
Hmm. Which means it turns out if you can make people feel isolated, that no one agrees with them because no one is saying what they're saying, that not only chills their speech, which of course is a good thing if you're trying to dominate and manipulate the information environment, it also instills doubt and shame in them. You know, they think, well, I'm, I must be wrong about this. People are telling me I'm terrible if I believe it. No one else believes it. And in a community like, say, an academic community or a social community online, if you can instill this kind of shame and doubt, you can manipulate the environment so that people will think that actually a view held by a small group, a faction, you know, say anti-vaxxers, for example, is actually held by a very large group because you've silenced and chilled the people who are on the other side who would normally be speaking out. And this too can become self-fulfilling because it's called the spiral of silence is what sociologists call this because the more you're silenced, the more I think no one agrees with me, the more I'm silenced. We're all kind of walking consensus detectors. Mm. We're very attuned to what we think other people around us believe and we try to harmonize with that. So you can spoof consensus with these tactics that chill debate conversation. Um, so how do we know this is happening? Surveys find that 60% of the American public and about two thirds, a little bit more than that of the student population are now afraid to give their true views on politics for fear of giving offense and running into social trouble. A third of Americans are afraid of talking about politics uh, because they fear that they might lose their job or lose career opportunities as a result. What's especially interesting about this, and this I think is new and important, is that the chilling is not limited to conservatives. In these polls, liberals, including very liberals, are just as likely to say that they are worried about losing a job or career opportunities if, they, if they're candid about their politics than very conservatives are. So why is that happening? Well, remember, this is information warfare. This is not about surgically targeting a viewpoint so that people know that talking about everything else is safe. This is about creating kind of a landmine environment where no one knows what you can talk about anymore because every day someone gets dragged and bombed on Twitter, loses a job, loses their friends, loses a reputation for saying something that yesterday seemed completely safe. That's manipulating the environment so that people will over-censor, they will over-chill, they will again become isolated, divided, demoralized, same kinds of things begin to go on. And that's how you get these situations in universities where professors are saying, you know, I'm a liberal, I'm a progressive, but I'm afraid of my students. There are whole subjects I won't go anywhere near just for fear of that I might get investigated. And now we're seeing that replicated increasingly in newsrooms and in the general population. And what I, what I try to emphasize to people is what, the same thing I've been emphasizing about Trump. This is not just happening coincidentally. This is a sophisticated form of information warfare designed to manipulate the social and media environments um, for political advantage. And that's how we should be treating it. And so uh, what you're saying, if I can just is bring this home, uh, in the halls of Ivy League institutions uh, the, and, and uh, senior suites and corporations, the sort of cancel culture, which is mostly from the left, is as powerful or similar in a way in its threatening, in the way in which it threatens free speech and free thought and, and free exchange of ideas, as in a small town somewhere where the Trump people are busy, you know, getting rid of anyone on the local council who doesn't agree with them about, I don't know, something, the election being stolen or something like that, that I mean. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but it's somewhat different, I suppose, in its character or... or, or well, or well not. all of Maybe these, that's yeah, the question. All of these tactics are different in their character. You know, the a version of canceling that was run in the Soviet Union was a much cruder version, where they just throw you in the gulag, right? They send you up to Siberia, and you're not heard from for 20 years right. or or forever. And that's another way of causing chilling. But um, Tocqueville comes to America in the 1830s. We we can't have an episode of conversations totally without right. mentioning Tocqueville, right? Absolutely, right. Um, That's good that you're on top of that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Tocqueville comes to America in the 1830s, and he says the biggest threat to liberty in America is what we now call cancel culture. He calls it tyranny of the majority. He does not realize minorities can play this game just as effectively by being organized and strategically targeting. 
But he says the problem is that in America, if you get on the wrong side of approved opinion, your livelihood, livelihood could be wiped out. People won't talk to you anymore. And so you'll just hunker down and stay silent. Um, and he's very worried about this. He's describing what we now call cancel culture. And he's pointing out that the enforcement of this, he says America is more free on paper than any other republic in the world. But in practice, socially, it's not. And this is why. So that tells us that these tactics are nothing new. Uh, but they're much easier to apply in an age where, you know, literally at the you know, push of a like button on Twitter, you can organize a mob against Bill Kristol for saying something bad or saying nothing in particular. Yeah. And, you know, let's not give people ideas, but I don't think they, didn't, <laughs> they didn't need you to say that to have that idea, though. But the, um, yeah, so, I mean, well, you mentioned, so that's social media, I suppose. How much has, you wrote the first book in 93, pre-social media, basically, uh, pre-internet almost, um, how much has that changed things? How much is it worse in the situation? Or is it more that the character of the universities and of our intellectual class has changed some and the kind of old-fashioned liberalism has been replaced by various fashionable forms of post-liberalism, which <laughs> legitimates this in some ways? I mean, they just... just so would it be cheating it. to answer that question, yes? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it all goes together, it, right? It, yeah. it is all of those things. It would be much harder to run a cancel campaign without... Twitter or its equivalent, because, you know, you'd actually have to go out and find people to sign letters and, and petitions and do physical organization, and that's really hard. So that was a barrier that, that people don't have anymore. But you don't need those technologies to make canceling work. We know that because of Tocqueville. We know because actually J.S. Mill in 1859, people forget this, but in On Liberty, he says the biggest threat to freedom yeah. in Britain is not government censorship. It's the quashing of individuality and what he calls eccentricity, by which he means, you know, individuals with dissenting views. So you don't need social media, but it sure does help. I mean, it really helps because you can organize a campaign against someone on campus, you know, literally within, within minutes. Uh, but you don't absolutely need that. Uh, people who study this stuff say that it's still the case, despite social media, that the bigger, uh, the more important forms of, of disinformation, fake news, viral conspiracy is still the media and above all politicians. Hmm. So Trump being president really matters. Oh, and, uh, you cannot overstate. Um, the biggest change here is not social media on the left, though so that's a big change. And obviously Trump uses it on the right in a big way. It's that never before have a major party and the White House been in the hands of a world-class propagandist. Yeah. And, and one just cannot overstate what a dramatic change that is and how hard it's going to be to undo now that everyone has seen the effects of these tactics on the left and on the right. The demonstration has been provided. So now the question is, can we adapt and live with these disinformation and propaganda tactics? Uh, can we adjust to them? Can we get some immunity to them? And that's what we're all struggling with right now. How much on the left do you think there's a bit of a healthy backlash against cancel culture, a reassertion of a kind of John Stuart Mill or liberalism, let's just say? Because uh, I do think, don't you think in the universities that it was made easier to go down this road by the kind of, uh, and there are a million ways you could describe it, but post-liberal and, you know, uh, Foucaultism, whatever, postmodern, you know, the whole kind of, well, who's to say what's true anyway, and then, you're, you know, and then people's feelings get hurt, and then in the old days you would have said, well, too bad, we're pursuing the truth here, you know, truth does hurt one's feelings sometimes, you know, and as we were saying earlier, but now it's, there's no truth, so feelings get hurt. I don't know, say a little bit about what your sense of the state of things is in universities, and let's just say in the, into the left intellectual world, mostly left intellectual world. Can I say green shoots? I am... Um People say my book is optimistic, and it kind of is because it's not fatalistic. What it really is is hopeful, and I think there are actually a lot of hopeful signs. And one of those hopeful signs relates to a point we, we talked about earlier, which is progressives have started to figure out that what's going on um, in cancel culture and on those authoritarian precincts of the left really has nothing to do with progressive values like being against racism or the rights of women or other minorities, that, that this is a separate layer 
of information warfare and that it's being used against progressives. So I, I think we're beginning to see resistance and an awakening form on the, on the, the liberal left, liberal small L, the, the pluralist left, saying, wait a minute, we can't function on a campus where we're afraid of our own students and can't conduct classes. That's not what we had in mind. That's not what we want. And we also see some counter-organization from lots and lots of groups. Counter-mobilization is key here because there's only so much an isolated individual can do by standing up if they're, you know, either up against a, a, a juggernaut sort of university administration and investigation, or if they perceive themselves to be up against a juggernaut, you need counter-mobilization. And we're seeing that too. We're seeing a lot of new groups, the, the Alliance, um, uh, the Academic Freedom Alliance, Princetonians for Free Speech, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, Counterweight Support, which is empowering employees who are being forced through um, to indoctrination campaigns at work. Um, at the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values just appeared out of nowhere. You know, like mm -hmm. that happened within the last couple of months. There are lots of people now saying, wait a minute, what's going on here isn't just progressivism. It's an attack on the fundamentals of, of liberal democracy, and we care about that too. So I think that's going to make a difference if it continues. I think actually it makes a big difference because the reason canceling and authoritarian leftism has spread so fast so far as it was basically unopposed, right? Because no one wanted to be against racism. Once people figure out, wait a minute, being against racism is being, it's very different from being against pluralism. I think maybe then we're in a different world. Do you think race was kind of a key to this? The, 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 the playing that card on the cancel culture left, uh, you know, obviously God knows there's plenty of legitimate things to worry about in terms of, of race and racism in America still, but uh, that seems like that was their most powerful way of shutting everyone up, that, you know, if, you, if they could accuse, other things seemed like they were more contestable, but no one wants to be, and for good reason, accused of being a racist, and somehow that when they were able to do that, to, to elide the difference between being bigoted, which some people are, and I suppose Trump hurt, Trump helped them in this respect, right, by by being actually somewhat racist, you know, <laughs> and, his, and, and the kinds of things he said and his supporters have now said. Uh, I don't know, I'm just curious how much you think this is a race-specific, race not race-specific, but... It's, yeah, it's, that's an interesting question to think about. I don't think it's race-specific in the sense that the tactics we're seeing have anything to do with the issues around race, per se. Right. Right. Uh, they're manipulative tactics that are, I think, exploiting the very high emotional valences around the racism issue. Uh, but they would also work around, you know, if there, if there were some other issue that, that had so much pull on yeah. Americans, you know, if it were guns or abortion, um, and sometimes it is those things, you can, you can apply the same dynamics to those things. And we actually see that, you know, we see there are precincts in which if you're pro-choice, you can't be a pro-choice progressive. I'm sorry, you can't be a pro-life progressive. Right. Rewind. Um, you can't be a pro-life progressive. You're drummed out. Um, you're the enemy. So, so the tactics are not exclusive to race, but they glom onto race because race has so much of this power and no one wants to be on the wrong side of it, understandably, justifiably. And then the right sees an opportunity and decides to make critical race theory like the main topic in American politics. And, yeah, and, the, and then people like us, who I think are probably not fans to the degree that, I'm not sure how much you've read, I've read a little bit of it, you know, the main authors who push that and the, 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 the curricula that I've seen that try to embody that point of view, not what I would prefer in, in schools or, and so forth, but then the right just goes crazy, make, you know, trying to pass legislation that would ban you from it is, or at least discouraged discussing slavery or something, and you know, and funny, and and uh, it just seems like that's a terrible cycle of cancel culture on the left and and uh, demagogic exploitation of this. Of yeah, they help each other, and that's easier yeah. to understand when you realize that what they're both what they have in common, although their ideological goals may be different and their parties may be different is that they're both running propaganda machines in order to demolish trust in institutions and in order to silence and demoralize and divide the target populations. And from their point of view, anyone who's doing that is in an institutional sense an ally. So, you yeah. know, in that sense, Lenin helps Hitler, right? Or Stalin helps Hitler. 
I, yeah. I don't mean to liken today's actors to Stalin and Hitler, but, but I am saying that, that people who use these tactics have similar large social goals, which is to make it harder for people like you and me and all the institutions that we spent two centuries building up um, to do the role that we, we think ought to be done, which is uh, keeping society in touch with, with reality and forcing ideas to go through a process of rigorous debate and making it very difficult for any one faction to manipulate and, and dominate the whole conversation. It was kind of a cliche of the old liberalism of, I guess, the 50s and 60s, and I remember encountering this a little in college, I guess, in the early 70s, um, you know, that the left and right come together, I guess this is now called horseshoe theory sometimes, and, you know, that the, the extremes of left and right come together in a way the Hitler-Stalin pact was a real thing in real history with its own incentives and the consequences, but also a kind of, I don't know what's the right word for this, you know, a synecdoche of a kind of way in which the totalitarianism of the right and the left were together. And I mean, in Hannah Arendt's book, it explicitly says they, they have more in common than than not, and, and the liberals understood that. And I remember at the time, that became it was almost a cliche, and it was sort of simple, it seemed to some, I remember this in college, grad school, sort of simple-minded almost, but, you know, but there was a lot of truth to that, I think, right? I mean, the, 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 the older liberalism was more sound than people like me. I mean, I was always, of course, sympathetic to it in a fundamental way in terms of our institutions and, and, and American liberal democracy, but somehow it, it, it was on to more, I think, in its opposition to the extremism and conspiracism and total, quasi-totalitarianism or real totalitarianism with the left and right than maybe one, one took for granted those insights rather than... Yeah, yeah. Well, the, you've always had authoritarian, anti-pluralist factions of, of both the right and left, and, and I think they've always been, to one extent or another, frenemies Yeah. for just that reason. But you've always also had non-authoritarian elements of the left and right, even the extreme left and, and right. Um, and I think that's... That's where hope lies in all of those people out there who are progressives, for example, who are starting to feel bullied. Uh, these are the people in, in newsrooms, in some of these mainstream media organizations where you've got factions now that are ruling entire conversations off limits or making them treacherous. And, and there are a lot of people in these environments and situations who are tired of feeling pushed around and bullied and silenced and who hold progressive values or, for that matter, conservative values while feeling no sympathy for authoritarian tactics. And that's, that's where hope lies, helping people understand that the tactics and the ideology are, can we say orthogonal? Whatever that yeah. means, they're different. They're different. No, I think that's, that's important. And uh, I'm struck by that. I taught a little, uh, let us, uh, on Zoom, a, a study group at the Harvard Institute of Politics this uh, spring and in talking to the students together, but especially alone in, in office hours, which were virtual, uh, the degree to which the students are worried about that, and these are liberal students mostly, as they made clear when they were talking to me, you know, welcoming me over as they saw it to their side more politically. But um, I know some of this is student on student too. It's not as, I think conservative people have been oh. focused on, you know, the mostly. teachers, the faculty. Yeah, and it's, it's they're worried that they make a comment or ask a question in a discussion in class or in the dorm. Uh, that's an honest question or a comment just speculating out loud about something in history or in literature or anything, and suddenly it can get s distorted, taken out of con ripped out of context, put on social media, and, you know, 12 hours later you wake up and you're sort of being pilloried. and, and uh, On campuses and, and also in newsrooms, yeah, that's exactly right. And the survey evidence strongly supports it that, in fact, um, many liberal students, progressive students, feel that they're being bullied in these environments by other students. It's primarily peer pressure. It's socially enforced. There are problems with speech codes and administrators in universities, uh, and that's no secret. But those are smaller problems now than exactly the kind of peer pressure that Tocqueville and Mill describe, which is harder to deal with. It's a, and it's a change since I wrote Kindly Inquisitors, because that was a book about a, a you know, what was 30 years ago, kind of a sharp pointed ideological attack from professors on free speech. And they were publishing doctrines and they were fomenting right. speech codes. And, you know, it was Catherine McKinnon and, and people like that. This is very different. It's much less ideological in that sense. And it's just more kind of about brute force domination by one faction of the intellectual environment because they're sure they're right 
or just because they can't. And that is that is different. Yeah, one thing your your book has helped me focus on is I've, I've, three or four years ago I did a little project with Bill Galston, a friend of ours, who's also been on these conversations, to, at a new center in, in certain policy areas. Could you have set, reasonable centrist policies? This was in 2017, and I certainly had the instinct. Bill's been laboring in these vineyards much longer. But, you know, it was just important to show that there could be policy agreement by people mostly on the left and mostly on the right on a bunch of things and didn't you know that would it would be healthy for the country just in a way to show that yeah there are reasonable policies on climate change that are kind of market friendly but also do solve some of the you know address the problem and same in other areas uh compromise kind of more centrist compromise and i at the time even i thought well that's good it's limited though and i'm, I'm more struck talking to you that this isn't what we're, what you're talking about isn't a kind of new center exactly. It's a new liberalism or whatever the right word is. But it's not simply a uh, the problem isn't so much getting the two sides to compromise. That's kind of a problem when you have ideologues on both sides and can you have a, a policy that's in between the two ideologies that uh, takes some of the best from both ideologies or whatever you know markets and welfare state you know whatever that's kind of more traditional you know you, know, you might say. Comp- compromise politics of the last 70 years. You're really talking about something different when you talk about defending uh, a Madisonian system of politics and of uh, thought or, I guess, uh, speech and discourse uh, against the illiberalism of left and right. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And part of what's happened, Bill, is that... Um, our side, I'm going to, by our side, I'm going to mean those, I'm going to say those of us who support the Constitution of Knowledge, the U.S. Constitution, the rule of law, um, adherence to facts, uh, belief in facts, um, and all of the disciplines and civic virtues and values that go along with those things. I'm just going to call those us, and I'm going to call them the pluralists, maybe the liberals, but um, first of all, we were, we were taken by surprise by all this stuff. You know, it never occurred to us that a, a Russian-style disinformation figure would rise in American politics. It, and it never occurred to us that we would see the, the development of social media and the almost instant harnessing of that to run socially coercive mob campaigns. You know, we, we just like, what? <laughs> um, so it takes a long time to get organized, even in the best of circumstances. But also, I think a lot of liberals became demoralized and lost confidence because we were repeatedly told, well, it's our fault, we failed, our institutions have failed, um, people are angry at us, they should be, and it's our fault. Well, I think, you know, certainly institutions have made big mistakes, no one denies it, but if one more person tells me this is all happening because of the Vietnam War, or inflation, or 9-11, or 2008, you know, I... I'll start pulling my hair out because I ask people, which, which countries or eras, institutions, would you prefer to the ones we have in America right now? I mean, which countries, courts, which countries, media? Do you want the yellow journalism of the 19th century? Do you want the police, the you know, problems now? Do you want the police forces of 100 years ago? And the answer is, well, they can't really come up with specifics. But I think too much we ourselves have bought into the notion that this is our fault and we're not recognizing that, in fact, from a bunch of sources, there have been prolific and organized and targeted and effective attacks on trust in America and on institutions in America, opportunistically for profit and for power, and that these things are effective um, and that we need to rally behind the values and systems we hold dear. They're not self-maintaining, and that begins with understanding that we're targeted um, and that we need to fight back. And that's, I think we're starting to see that happen, and I can give you chapter and verse on that, but that's really the key element. I mentioned earlier, to round out this thought, that, that all of this disinformation warfare propaganda has as the ultimate goal to demoralize the other side, because demoralization is demobilization. If you think you're isolated or helpless or shamed or, or you can't keep up with the flood of mistruth and you don't know what to do about the conspiracy theories, you throw up your hands and you say, my God, everything is terrible. I don't know what to do. Well, that's the condition that they, broadly speaking, are trying to induce. That's the whole ballgame. That's what Putin is doing. 
with his information war campaigns against America. And the beginning of the solution to that is to understand that we're being demoralized on purpose um, and to begin to get our act together. And I think it's, don't you think, though, it's, it's easier to get one's act together in a way on the political front, because I think we kind of know what the institutions are that we should be defending and rule of law and, you know, the separation of powers and checks and balances and all the things that have been set up to try to check uh, tribalism from spilling over into real authoritarianism and effective authoritarianism. And I would say I've had this, the debate endless times, it seems to me, on the uh, the liberal world order, wherever, which is what you were saying. Everyone says how terrible it, all the bad aspects of it. And But can we actually look back at the last 70 years and agree that they were better than the preceding, you know, 50? And and is, is free trade been that bad for people's lives around the world? And, and uh, the U.S. kind of led global order and so forth. So I think one challenge, though, is in the area you're talking about, let's call it knowledge, information. It's a little o- less obvious. And so I think in their case, too, I would say we need NATO, we need alliances, democracies, we need the U.S. forward presence, we need mostly free trade. And free, you know, there, there are sort of obvious things one defends, and then other people criticize them, and you have a semi-policy debate, at least. Uh, it seems to me in the area of information, it's a little less obvious what the institutional structure is. Uh, the organizational structure, the the infrastructure that defends what 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 we're talking about. So say say what you thought about that. You know, a lot, I'm, so. yeah, I'm actually more hopeful on the epistemic front than the political front because in the political front you have to pass laws. You know, you're going to have to agree on what a reform bill is going to look like and and get it through Congress, and that's very difficult. On the epistemic front, what we're talking about is first understanding the nature of the situation we're in, which is what we've been talking about. But then most of the institutions and practices that need to be strengthened and defended are in the private realm. And they're actually in the realm that people very often can influence in their own community or on their own campus. And that's everything from the president of the University of Chicago, um, creating and adopting, as other, many other universities now have, the Chicago Statement, or for example, a faculty member at Chicago uh, made a very controversial tweet, something about affirmative action, and the usual gang of two or three hundred people signed an online petition to get him investigated. And President Zimmer of the university put out basically a short one paragraph statement saying we at Chicago believe in free speech. That has been exercised here. There's nothing to investigate. And guess what all the petitioners, all these righteous did? They went away. Hmm. So that's one small example, but we're seeing there's tons of front... A hard thing about this book is is that it's not just the three bullet points. It's going to be an all-of-society reaction, many institutions, many levels, no two quite alike, but it's going to be everything from platform redesign of places like Facebook and Twitter. We're already seeing that on, on Twitter now. If you try to retweet a link without reading it, you'll be interrupted. You'll, you'll, they'll say, are you sure you want to do that? Facebook's new oversight board is doing, it's how we dealt with these problems in the past, actually. These are not new problems entirely, which is you build institutions that begin to create guidelines and norms, and then if they work, they begin to spread. Others begin adopting them. That's how we got out of the yellow journalism and fake news of the 19th century. Uh, American Society of Newspaper Editors was formed in the early 20th century. It promulgates norms and ethics. Others adopt them. Journalism schools open. They teach them. The profession begins to become a profession. The prizes begin to be given to good journalism, create changing incentives. So it's that at many levels. Um, it's individuals organizing to push back against these small factions that are dominating debate. It's getting smart about propaganda in the media. Um, that's We already had a big step forward. In 2020, uh, the media, mainstream media, did a much better job of resisting disinformation than they did in 2016. Um, And it's partly just the population, the target population needs to wise up, which is kind of what my book is about. It's still possible to manipulate a a population that's conscious that it's being manipulated. These are powerful tactics. Uh, They're hard to resist, but it's harder. You can create some level of immunity just by helping people understand that they are being manipulated. So it's, it's lots of stuff like that, and it doesn't rely on any one or two things, one bottleneck like Congress to get it right. Yeah, of course, that cuts both ways in terms of being hopeful and not because I could argue, and I'm curious what your response. I mean, in some ways, I could see getting to voting rights legislation 
in Congress that would, you know, strengthen protections of vote and, and beat back some of these efforts at the state level and so forth, but also do some reasonable voter ID so it's not entirely one-sided, whatever. That, in a way, is a, it's difficult, but one can say, couldn't one, that that's more manageable, perhaps, in theory. One can figure out how you might get X number of Republicans and Democrats on a bill, and, you know, the Biden administration could do this and that. Uh, whereas you look at the universities, you look at sort of parts of the corporate world, you look at uh, parts of the culture, and you think, how do you even get your arms around that? I'm, I'm sort of more optimistic about the 100 senators, maybe, or at least I could argue this, than about the 100 top universities. And I don't, and, and as you say, what's, it's good that they're private or dispersed or state level. They're not, there's not one place that, there's not one bottleneck, but on the other hand, there's not one lever to kind of strengthen institutions either. It really is a kind of bottom-up thing, I suppose, right? I mean, yeah, bottom up, top down also in the sense that you're going to have to have institutional leadership. Yes. Uh, yeah, I could argue it either way. I don't think we know the answer yet, but I'll, I'll sort of make a kind of meta point, gain a little bit more altitude and say that even if it's true that the problem is harder in the epistemic realm than the political realm, and even if it's true that the problem is just wicked hard, we have, we have to act as if it's not. Yeah. We have to remember at all times that, that the goal of the illiberal side is to demoralize us so that we will throw up our hands and say nothing can be done. That's the product. That's the end game for them. And when we start acting as if that's not true, just by doing that, we make life a great deal harder for them. So the despair that I hear in the quarters of small L liberalism, pluralism, you know, how will we ever cope with social media? And, and look, at, look at Trump's complete... And, and MAG is complete domination of the Republican Party and, and, and so forth. Well, that's not the right attitude to start with. The right attitude to, be start with, to start with is there's a whole lot that can be done here. And a lot of it actually isn't that difficult. But it begins with self-confidence and counter-mobilizing. And I guess winning in one place can have a big ripple effect, right? I mean, what you mentioned about Chicago. You know, the beating back the mob a few times can... If, if mob victories are demoralizing to believers in pluralism or liberalism or free speech and so forth, the defeat for the mob can be Huge. demoralizing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this, is, this is why the Russians work so hard to stifle voices like Sakharov and Omalrik and, and Solzhenitsyn. There's an experiment here, a classic experiment. It'll take a minute and a half to explain. No, but please, if you'll, if you'll indulge me. Totally, yeah, yeah. It's... it's so 1951, a guy named Solomon Ash puts eight people in a room and tells them they're being given a, a vision test. And they're asked which of three lines, just plain black lines, is the same length as a fourth line. And he makes it obvious. Anyone with two eyes knows that the correct answer is B. It's not even close. But then... This is in the U.S.? I mean, this is, this in, is the, in the U.S., yeah. yeah. However, seven out of the eight people in that room are confederates of the experimenter, and they've all been told to say that the right answer is C, not B. What does the eighth person in the room do when confronted with seven other people giving an obviously, blatantly wrong answer? A third of the time, the eighth person conforms. Hmm. Um, and 75% of individuals conformed in at least one trial. And that's either because they're lying but want to go along with the group, or it's because they doubt themselves. Well, maybe it's an optical illusion and they're getting something that I'm not. And this is a classic experiment. It's been replicated many times in, in many variations. And it goes to how cancel culture works, which is if you manipulate the environment so it sounds like everyone believes the same thing, then you begin to doubt yourself. You begin to shame yourself. There's a variant of this experiment. So same experiment, one experimental subject, but now of the other seven people in the room, six of them give the wrong answer. One of them gives the right answer. So the experimental subject now has one, call it reality partner, just one. In that situation, the percentage conforming drops from about a third to about 5%, just because one other person in that room is saying, you know, the obvious right answer is B. So this is a point Robert George has made at Princeton. You don't need 500 members of a faculty to begin to change the climate. You can do it with five. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
<clears throat> you can do it with five. Um, so one mustn't feel hopeless in these situations. Yeah, that's why authoritarians have been so are always correctly, I think, worried about dissidents who, from a sort of objective, uh, you know, point of view, you might say, power point of view of power politics. I mean, what what influence do they have? Leave them alone. They're just lonely people, you know, shouting uh, into the wind in a sense. But they've always had the sense, smart authoritarians, that you know you can't let that get out of begin because it could get out of hand. Right? Havel writes very well about this. I think. Yes, <clears throat> spirals of silence can collapse very quickly, as they had in the Soviet Union and other places. And so, yeah, it's a good thing to conclude on. So you're somewhat hopeful, I would say, on the academy and on fighting back against the cancel culture of the left and the kind of possible strength of a revived liberalism or pluralism. Do you have a preference in terms of terms there? I'm, I've become sort of... T- well, I just call it the constitution of knowledge because I think institutionally that's what we're fighting for. The real work my book does, the reason it will be read, at, you know, in a thousand years when Plato is long forgotten. There you go. Is it the, <laughs> the real work You're not allowed to book. say that on conversations, but that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Can I, well, when Tocqueville's been forgotten. It's a free, it's a free country. <laughs> You're allowed to say this. That's pluralism, right? Yeah, you can pretend that Tocqueville's But in, in all seriousness, the real work of this book is, is not the applications which we've been discussing. It's the effort to map out in, in very specific ways what is the constitution of knowledge? How does it work? What are the Madisonian elements that keep it going? You know, checks and balances, the dispersion of power. What are the rules that people are required to follow? What are the institutions? There there are four really big sectors, uh, science and research, comma, journalism, comma, government, comma, law, and there are others. And it maps all of that. So so that's what I think we're defending. It's, It's not just vague liberal principles. It's a concrete, defined system of organizations and institutions and rules, and they're not self-sustaining. They worked so well in the past that we thought they were self-sustaining. All you need is free speech, and then you have a marketplace of ideas, and truth automatically emerges. Well, that's not true. You need all of that stuff in the middle, all of those institutions and norms, all of that Madisonian stuff, structure, has got to be there. And the key is you've got to understand that stuff and defend it and not taking it for granted. But, but frankly, Bill, I think if the Constitution of Knowledge and its partisans get our act together, I think actually we squash the other side like a bug in the long run because we have two big advantages. One is that they're completely parasitic. They cannot make knowledge. They cannot put a vaccine in your arm. All they can do is tear down. Um, we have... We can promise a better life for actual people. We can show them if you're tired of these constant wars on campus between, you know, with, with people who are trying to dominate you and intimidate you. If you're tired of that, you can change it. There is a better way. And then we have a second big advantage, and that's reality itself. Uh, one of the things that's been established, very interesting by scholars of propaganda, is that propagandists go down their own rabbit holes. We see that in the Republican Party right now. It's not like they can sit there and have a ledger somewhere. This is true. This is false. This is the true stuff we know. This is the false lies we're spreading. They get it mixed up themselves. They kind of have to in order to be persuasive. No one even knows what Trump believes at this point and what he's lying about. And that's become increasingly true of the Republican Party. But in the long term, that's a terrible disadvantage because they lose touch with reality and those systems those systems collapse for that reason too. So I'm not preaching that the good guys inevitably win. I'm just saying we have a ton to work with. And, and if we rally, if we defend, if we understand our strengths, and if we make our case and build institutional safeguards on many levels, yeah, I, th- I think we win. Yeah, no, I, I, I usually think so, but I occasionally, the <laughs> vaccines is a good example. I mean, I think one point we didn't emphasize enough in this conversation, but I'll just mention it now, and you can elaborate a bit if you want as we close, is, you know, there are institutions, uh, I mean, there are medical schools, there's science. I mean, it's not like uh, the 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 uh, propagandists have all the have the upper hand. There's an awful lot of people who remain committed, you know, employed by, committed to operating in, making advances in, these reality-based efforts in various aspects of our society and economy and science and so forth. 
that people do see the results of. So it's not as uh, the vaccines, though. So on that, so I think that's a good point to make. I mean, that it's not as if we're people look at the universities and think, oh my God, people are just going to be sw- the, the sort of cancel culture is going to swamp everything, postmodernism, post truth. But it's not that easy when you can look around and they really are real results of certain things, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. The results. On the other of- hand, the vaccines. I'm a little. Sp- Shouldn't the vaccines have had more effect? I mean, do you want an actual case study of why science, knowledge, you know, empiricism of a kind, pluralism, which you want a lot of different people competing to develop them, um, you know, pretty good case study of why, let's call it the modern scientific uh, effort, what's the word I'm looking for, a project, you know, deserves some defense and some respect. But here we are, and the you know half the country is ignoring. I don't know, not half the country, but I'm a little. I'm a little. It seems like that should have been more of a learning, a teachable moment, as they say, and a learning moment for the country. And it, people seem to be chugging right along, you know. And, well, a lot of people are, and a lot of people always will. the The reality based community is a huge global network, but mostly of professionals. You know, it's very hard to become a lawyer, a scientist. Even a journalist, you know, you don't do that just sitting on your sofa making stuff up. You you got to learn a lot of a lot of norms and usually be attached to an institution. So there's always going to be a substantial chunk of any population which is not really part of that community and isn't directly involved in it. And often that doesn't matter. You know, it's not a big deal if if some people have strange religious beliefs of whatever kind. Um, it does become an issue when you've got a pandemic and you've got a virus, and it's really quite important that people uh, understand what are trustworthy and reliable sources. And, and yeah, it's, you know, the, the point I'm making is a hard line to walk because you want people to be alarmed but not fatalistic and hopeful but not complacent. And we need to remember when we look at, what, 40% of Americans who are vaccine hesitant, you know, there are all kinds of reasons for that, but one of them, again, is that they have been systematically targeted for a period of years now by anti-vaxxers who have been running a very sophisticated online operation of consensus spoofing, making it appear as if lots and lots of scientists think vaccines are harmful when actually essentially none do. They pioneered a lot of the tactics that were subsequently picked up by other parts of the disinformation network. And so that has a result, too. So this is what we're up against, Bill. And, and I guess the thought that I'm trying to instill us all in is um, this, this is this is not an easy road that we're on. We're up against new technologies like social media and new actors like Donald Trump and the Republican Party um, and some people with who are who are very fervently illiberal in ways that we are just not accustomed to in America. So it's going to be touch and go. And I'm not telling people we squash them like a bug by doing nothing. I'm telling them we start. If we start, if we get our act together, yeah, I think this winds up looking like a number of other past information disruptions that came out okay. But it might not come out okay. Or a lot of damage could be done before it comes a out A lot okay. of damage is, and is already being done. Yeah, no, that's the... Of the short run much. is, the short and medium run, yeah. If the only way out is through, then we've got some, we've got some problems. I mean, you mentioned my father earlier in reality. It reminds me of, uh, he famously quipped that, you know, a neoconservative is a liberal who is mugged by reality. And I always thought that was a little, uh, I mean, it's a good line, and it captures a lot. It's a little unjust almost to, to himself and to the intellectual effort. But it's not, a, and actually a young colleague of his who died very young, Mike Scully, I don't know if you knew him at all, uh, was commenting in the 80s that as the plenty of people were able to avoid uh, coming to grips with the implications of reality and that uh, well, his line was that some other people were liberals who had been mugged by reality but refused to press charges. <laughs> I think that's a very good line. Because you need to have a successful system, both the recognition of reality but the what you're calling for here, the pressing of charges, if I can put it that way, the, the sort of making the case and explaining and discrediting the people who are spending all their time quite consciously uh, undermining the yeah. lessons of reality. It can't just no, that's be a exactly passive. Right. Yeah. That's exactly right. You know, your father never could resist a quip. And, and one of the ones that I think about most often, I'm not sure if he said this in print or to me, but he said, there's nothing wrong with this country that a nice little depression wouldn't solve. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know. A recession. I thought his the soft was it recession? It was recession. Well, I think it was a line of someone else. I mean, decades ago, maybe Schumpeter or something. Recessions are the discipline of the middle class, in the sense of you know you get these bubbles and people get op- wildly optimistic about things and make foolish investments and so forth, and then there's kind of a reality wake up. No, I, I, I took but, him to be making a different point, which is too many Americans have too much time to obsess about culture war things and stuff. No, that's that true too. Yes, isn't fundamentally important and and maybe a Maybe a hard slap of reality. I'm <laughs> no, no. But mostly enough, he th- was just being. Mostly no, no, he was think, just being Irving. No, no. I think it's a fair point too, and this is where the pandemic came in and has both been a bit of a wake up call, but also the degree to which on both sides, in in the halls of academia, on, on the one hand, and the chamber and the and the uh, electoral, I don't know, the rallies of the Republican Party on the other, it's there's a lot of resistance but this is what your book and has pointed out so well why there's that resistance and 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 also that it's not just natural but it's been uh purposely fostered and stimulated i think that's a very important point because it's so much of the discussion just to close with your original point is and i've been in a million of these conversations as you have we've been in some of them together on zoom in the last year and you know social media and uh, you know the, the great sorting and red american blue american all these things are important but they do make it seem as if this just sort of happened as a result of forces beyond our control or forces of 30 or 50 years ago that got launched and then kind of got out of control but the degree of the purposefulness of the misinformation and disinformation uh and if the propaganda and the damage that's done, I think that's a key point you make. Yes, I, in my Irving Irving K mode, um, the way I put it, which is a, a wild exaggeration, but it does make the point, is that the the death of trust in American institutions um, is not fundamentally uh, natural death by natural causes, and it's not fundamentally suicide. Uh, it's an assassination. No, that is a good. That's a good line and a good and an important one. John Roush, thank you for joining me today on Conversations. Thank uh, you, Bill. It's been a pleasure. And thank you all for joining us on Conversations.